Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and kick off with our uh, second presentation. Um, a good compliment to follow up the presentation that we just heard. Uh, we have with us now Mike Shannon, who's a regional biologist for Iowa and Southern Minnesota from Ducks Unlimited. Um, also here with him today is Rick Rachota, uh, design engineer for Ducks Unlimited. Um, but mainly Mike is going to talk to us about restoring shallow, shallow lakes in Iowa. Uh, we're going to get some ecology and some biology thrown in with you guys. So uh, I'm really excited to, to follow up the last presentation uh, from Ducks Unlimited and Mike Shannon. Well, thanks for inviting me here today. I appreciate it. Um, I think from past experience, it's not something that Ducks Unlimited normally comes to. People have, have a tendency to think of Ducks Unlimited as a uh, hunting organization or something like that. Ducks Unlimited primarily is a habitat organization. Uh, our mission is the uh, conservation of wetland habitat, and that can come in many forms, many shapes, and uh, working with a variety of partners. So, uh, what I want to talk about today is Ducks Unlimited's what we call our Living Lakes Initiative, which really is. Uh, bringing life back to Iowa's shallow lakes. And the, uh, the uh, Living Lakes Initiative really is, is uh, central, north central Iowa and southern Minnesota. I, I only work in uh, Iowa, so I'll go to that. Uh, but uh, with my counterpart takes care of the Minnesota part. But uh, you know, I focus on the wetland restoration, wetland uh, conservation here in Iowa. Uh, when we talk about shallow lakes, I'm primarily talking about large marshes and lakes of less than six feet. Um, six feet in depth, most of them really average about two to three feet. Um, so these are, you know, kind of a bit more glaciated landscape in the, what we call the Moine Low, uh, geographic area where the, the last glaciers came down through the Dakotas, through western and southern Minnesota into central Iowa. Uh, so for, for Iowa, it's an area from about the Moines north of the state line and maybe from kind of just west of Spirit Lake over towards Mason City. So that, that's kind of the area we're talking about. It's, it's a, some areas are really flat, but other areas, if you look, you get these terminal and, and uh, lateral moraines that are really hilly, short, sharp hills with lots of wetlands in them. And that's where you find these shallow lakes a lot of times. Um, and so they're very productive wetland habitat. And, uh, you know, I just want to talk about what Ducks Unlimited is doing with, with our partners uh, to conserve these lakes and, and uh, help restore them to, to good health. Um, pre settlement, Iowa had about three and a half million acres of wetlands, most of them in that Des Moines Lake. Um, typically, it was a mix of prairie potholes with larger lakes. Um, you know, some lakes permanent, some of them maybe they're only wet, you know, some of these wetlands only wet for two weeks out of the year or something like that. Uh, but it was a real complex of, of wetlands uh, through this. And, you know, we had about 30 million acres of grassland. I mean, it was a very, very productive system. And the first settlers here recognized it for what it was. I mean, it's so productive. I mean, what makes good wetlands, good prairie, now makes good farmland. And that's the basis for Iowa's economy. That's what's made Iowa so successful. Um, but it's come with some costs, you know. Um, and then some of them that we're just now understanding and still trying to figure out how to get a handle on. And uh, a lot of that, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion lately about water quality. It's in the news all the time. It's a major topic here uh, today. Um, and that's one of the, the issues that's come about with the, the uh, degradation of these shallow lakes. When you look at shallow lakes today throughout, uh, throughout the northern part of the state, this, you see something like this. This is uh, Silver Lake, I believe, up in Palo Alto County. Um, you know, very intensively used landscape, highly modified. Uh, hydrology has been, been really, really modified. Ditch, tile drain, stuff like that. Um, the lakes themselves don't have the watershed they once did because there's been 100 years of trying to get water away from those lakes so you can dry them out. Um, so the watersheds are vastly different. Um, the land use is a lot different. Um, you know, a lot of times there's no buffers. It's agriculture right down to the end of the water. In the foreground, you can see a couple of dry potholes. You know, those have been tiled, uh, so they're being drained and converted to farm ground. Um, it's, you know, you can see kind of on the uh, upper left there, you got a little bit of residential development coming in now. Uh, so there's all kinds of disturbances happening with these lakes. And so you get, rather than a large marsh, which is this, what this was probably historically, you get open windswept water. I mean, this may only be two or three feet deep, but there's no vegetation, no emergent vegetation out there. Typically more turbid, lots of uh, algae in the system, um, and it can cause some real issues there. You look at it a little closer, you see something. This is Diamond Lake up in Dickinson County, one of the first shallow lake restoration projects we did with DNR. Um, it's kind of indicative of what you see, just kind of that straight, flat shoreline, no vegetation out there, nothing to break up the wind. Uh, the wave action is just coming across there, it suspends the sediments, 
um, and so you get really turbid water, um, and it causes lots of issues. Really, this is almost a biological desert, if you will. Uh, there's nothing there for fish. There's nothing there for waterfowl. Um, there's nothing there for boaters because I mean it's kind of nasty, you know, muddy water. It's just not too aesthetically appealing. And so you know they've lost a wide variety of uses. Um, the other thing I want to mention, uh, I should mention this on the, the previous slide, is most of the time these lakes now they kind of have a fixed crest. I mean we've modified the, the, the hydrology so much that you know they have an outlet, and so they fill up a certain level and any excess flows out, and so they don't fluctuate through the year. I mean historically. You know, wetlands are very dynamic. You know, they change, water levels change through the year, you know, up and down, and also from year to year. You got flood cycles and drought cycles and all that. Uh, we've taken that kind of dynamic out of the system, and so they're pretty much very stable. And that takes away uh, that productivity. That's what, that's what made them so productive in the first place. So we've taken that out of the system, and we've watched these systems just crash. So today, Iowa shallow lakes are facing a whole variety of threats and degradations. Um, you know, as I said, it, we used to have, you know, 3.5 million acres. Now we've lost over 90% of our original wetlands. Uh, they've been drained or converted to other uses. The remaining ones, so some of these lakes are still there, um, but just because they're there doesn't mean they serve the same functions. They're highly modified and uh, uh, they're just not functioning where they ought to. Um, high stable water levels, you know, we talked about that. Um, and that, that results in a loss of uh, Habitat value to you know the plants kind of the emerging plants kind of degrade, go away, becomes open water over time. There's a lot of carp out there now that's a non-native uh, that's moved into these systems, causing water quality problems. Um, just the nutrient runoff, uh, the turbidity, um, the open windswept water uh, presents a lot of, presents a lot of water quality problems. And so basically, a decline in uh, the habitat value to to wildlife, to fish, and to the plant communities. And also diminished recreational uh, habitat, I mean, have, uh, uses for people. You know, I was, this was one thing I learned when I moved to the state. People like their lakes. I mean, they flock to the lakes. Um, but nobody wants to go out there in the green, in the green water and recreate, you know. So you've seen that use decline too. And also, um, because of that fixed crest and, and the water levels really can't go up and down, we have lost that uh, flood storage capacity. You know, if you had a three inch runoff, Three-inch rainfall event, and that water comes to the lake, it just shoots right on down the ditch, causes problems downstream. Well, it's historically, I mean, there are, you've heard they're a big sponge. Um, they can store that runoff event and let it out slower, um, and so you don't get those big flood events downstream. Now, with these fixed crests, you don't have any room. You don't have that bout, the room for that handle that bounce, and so all that water is going downstream and creating downstream problems. So there's a whole litany of issues now with, currently with these problems. Um, in 2007, Dexter Limited, along with DNR and some of our other partners, initiated the Living Lakes in, uh, Initiative um, to conserve these shallow lakes, try to bring them back. Now, you know, Dexter Limited, you know, I'm a waterfowl biologist. I have a tendency to look at things and, and value to ducks. I mean, I'm, I'm a duck head. I, I want to see ducks out there. Um, but what makes a good duck project can also make a good fish project, a good flood control project, a good water quality project. So I may talk about ducks, but you can insert water quality in the same thing, and the same project can do the same thing. So oftentimes people go, that's a duck project, that's a fish project. I'm going to say there is no such thing. I mean, it's, it's system-wide. You know, they all get lumped together. They all have multiple benefits. So the Living Lakes Initiative, you know, we're out there seeking to restore drained shallow lakes and the large wetlands where it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of drained lakes around, uh, but you have to have the land base to do that. You have to have the ability to work with the drainage systems that are out there because we can't impact the neighbor's drainage system. But where we can control that, you know, where, where say DNR or Fish and Wildlife Service has that land, we can go out and restore those wetlands. Um, we're also working to enhance and actively manage the degraded shallow lakes, like you saw Silver Lake or uh, some of these other lakes, um, where they're still there, working with the factors that have influenced it to, to bring it back to productivity. Restore the small wetlands and the grasslands around that. Build those filter strips, build, improve that sponge, if you will, that should be out there. And then in certain places, strategic acquisitions. Um, say up around Spirit Lake, where it's rapidly developing a lot of residential development. Try to protect those shorelines so you can protect waterfall in those areas. And also influence public policy. Um, you know, a lot of federal funding, federal and state funding, could benefit these types of projects. 
working with legislators to kind of keep that spigot open, keep those funding programs going, and then also conduct research and monitoring. We want to know what we're doing is the right thing. We want to know, um, you know, how to go about correcting certain issues, and, and the research and monitoring is the right way to do that. I just want to take a minute to kind of walk you through the process here of how we go about restoring some of these lakes. Um, this graphic here kind of shows the current condition of a lot of these lakes. It's a little bit exaggerated, if you will, but uh, there's a few of them out there that are, that are this bad. Um, most lakes, again, they can be very shallow, but there's no, no emergent, emergent wetland vegetation in, left in them. Uh, very turbid water, uh, both from nutrient runoff, but also from wind action, stirring up sediments. You got the carp in there. Carp are out there chasing benthic invertebrates. They're digging in the mud, trying to find bugs or uprooting vegetation. Um, they're stirring up that water, and with that open water like that, no, no uh, vegetation to stop the wave action, it just stays suspended. Uh, but also in the uplands around the lake, again, that buffer is gone most of the time. So any runoff beds are carrying all that sediment, all those excess nutrients straight into the water. Um, and also, if you look on the left side there, you got those culverts. Again, that's indicative of that fixed crest there. So there's really no room for bouncing that lake up or down. It's set, set elevation all the time. The end result, again, is typically very bad water quality. Um, you kind of see off this photo here, um, what you're seeing there about five inches into the water. See that second, you just about five inches down, and that's because the algae blooms that happen in there because of that excess nutrients. So a uh, very common problem in a lot of these uh, uh, lakes right now. So what we want to do is give wetland managers and land managers the ability to go in there and manipulate water levels. Again, it's a very natural thing. Uh, water levels going up and down, the natural processes depend upon that. Uh, we've taken that ability away. So the first step in all this is going in and putting in a water control structure so that they can dewater the lake. And that, no, that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but what happens is if you pull that water down, uh, you can kind of consolidate bottom sediments, you get that vegetation going again. Most of the vegetation you're looking for has to have a mud flat to germinate. And so occasionally you have to pull that down, create that mud flat, and those cattails, bulrushes, sedges, things like that will come back. When you do that, you know, you're, you're holding that soil in place, you're using up those nutrients um, and make, make it a lot better wildlife habitat. Also, in the meantime, you have to work outside of the lake. You know, the, 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 the buffer strips, um, the filter strips around the lake, the prairie habitat, and then also a little bit higher, maybe working with some of those uh, historic prairie cockles, getting those back in there so that water collects in those, goes through the filter before it goes to the lake. So I know that uh, there was some talk about planting vegetation during the previous presentation. Um, all of these projects that we're talking about here, we don't plant any vegetation. All we're doing is giving land managers the ability to manipulate water so that they can produce the right type of vegetation. If you dewater these lakes at the right time, um, you get the vegetation that comes in on these mud flats. And the, that seed is there already. The seed bank's there in the soil. And all you have to do is create the correct conditions. And so all we're trying to do is give them the ability to go do their job to make the wildlife habitat. So after you get those plants going, you give it about a year to grow so they come up, put the board back in the structure, close it off, let natural rain events fill up that lake again, and it moves in back under that vegetation, and you get your wetland back. And the end result is, you know, you got that shoreline vegetation in the shallow areas, you got some earth aquatic vegetation, that supports a lot of uh, aquatic invertebrates. The aquatic invertebrates are supporting fish, or fish populations, waterfowl populations, all that, the wildlife is back. Um, you got the prairie around the lake, you know, so you got that buffer zone in there again. And in the background, you can see the uh, shallow water habitat, the prairie popples that are back a little bit higher on the landscape there. So again, that's recreating that big sponge effect that we used to have um, so that water collects in these things and works its way through the system rather than rushing down through the system. So if you remember back, the one slide I had that was just totally green, algae-covered water, this is the same wetlands two years after that. So basically, you get the vegetation back in there, uh, it's cleaning up the water. And, uh, you know, the results can be quite dramatic. Um, and one thing to keep in mind here, too, is a lot of these shallow lakes, the, the natural fish habitat, uh, the natural fish populations are perched in northern pike. DNR typically goes back in if you have enough water, like six feet deep water, they restock those fish because they've evolved to 
uh, exist in those conditions, that shallow water marsh condition, they do quite well. <coughs> And again, the, the, the monitoring to see how these projects function, uh, working with DNR a little bit on that. Um, they've been monitoring some of these lakes both before and after, lakes that haven't been enhanced, lakes that have been enhanced, and then following through the process. And what we're seeing is uh, after the restoration, uh, water clarity is about two and a half times what it was beforehand. So if you have cleaner water, you're getting that light penetrating through the water, you're getting that submerged aquatic vegetation, coming up, um, and again, that's better fish and wildlife habitat and better water quality. And the thing to keep in mind, like I said, this is not just in in lake. You know, that's unlimited. We have a tendency to work on the structures. That's our expertise. Um, but as part of that partnership, we're also working in the uplands because it takes a multitude of different approaches to fix the problem. It's just, it's not just one thing that, that messed up the lake. It's going to take multiple actions to fix it. So it's a watershed-wide approach. So, you know, what wetland restoration, grassland restoration, filter strips, uh, the grass waterways, anything that improves soil conservation and nutrient management, all of those are going to benefit the lakes and are going to benefit the uh, water quality throughout the whole system. So, like I said, that's a limited. Mainly our part in all of this is primarily the structure. We have engineers like Rick on staff um, that, that, that specialize in working with these water management systems. Um, and so we have the ability to go in there, assess what's there, you know, talk to the managers, what do they need to bring that lake back to productivity, and design new structures. A lot of these structures, I mean, there are, some of them are approaching 80, 90 years old, and they weren't very adequate at that point in time. They were just there to dam up the lake. Um, they really weren't there to manage the lake. And so the wildlife area managers can't do what they need to do with these structures. And plus the fact that, you know, 80 years of ice on them and, and everything else, they're just playing falling apart. So that's something that has the ability to help fundraise for these projects, uh, design new projects, um, and do the construction management, hire the contractor to go out there and uh, put in a structure that's going to work for, for the biologists, for the well managers. And they come in a wide variety of issues. I mean, everyone's an individual project, um, different stop loss structures, pumps, wells, anything that it needs to make that particular site function the way it's supposed to. Um, you know, a lot of them, again, go from a, uh, just a flat crest on, on there to something that's with stop logs that they can manage water levels at different elevations whenever they want to do that to promote healthy vegetation. And, you know, it's all about ease of management and flexibility. And, uh, like I said, each, each particular project is, is uh, tailored for that particular site. Um, this particular instance here, there's some sloughs along In Ingham High Lake up in, uh, you know, I think it's Palo Alto County. Uh, Ingham High, they're kind of on the right, center right. It's a large wetland complex. Um, but there's several little wetlands that are kind of on the side that are isolated from the lake itself, but they're, they're connected very high water. On the far left, you can see McGuan Slough. That pump you saw on the previous slide is right on the corner there uh, between those two. We use it to pump down McGuan Slough. And so you could revegetate the lake. If you look at that, you can see the wetland vegetation that, that, that circles that lake now. Um, and look at the difference in the water, the ball of water clarity. On these aerial photos, when you see black, that's clean water. When you see the gray or green, that's pretty turbid water. And so just the act of pumping down that 25 acre wetland allowed that vegetation to come down and then it refilled naturally through runoff from the surrounding ground. And if you stand at that side where that pump is, if you look to the right, out on Ingham High, you see maybe two cormorants flying by looking for baby carp to eat. If you look at the other side, there's about 20 species of birds out there. Um, so you can really see the difference in, in just the attractiveness of the habitat. And the other side, you know, we talk about water management, giving the landowner, landowner the land manager the ability to go out there and manage that water the way they need to. The other side of that is carp management because carp are in all water bodies in Iowa. Um, they are a scourge, you know, so we have water quality issues that are treated strictly by the carp. We can go out and give the landowner the management ability to, to take care of the well, but the carp will get right back in there. So every structure really has some kind of carp, you know, some kind of fish barrier on it. You can see the uh, hanging fingers on this one. The others might be velocity tubes, which, you know, the downstream end of the project, um, having some kind of, if you have enough fall, it requires quite a bit of fall, Kind of like a concrete culvert where water rushes through there at such high velocity the carp can't swim back up against it. And oftentimes there's a redundancy. You'll have maybe both of these types, you know, the hanging fingers or something like that, um, but then also velocity barriers just 
to make sure nothing gets past it. Because again, the carp, uh, it's, it's hard, I cannot overemphasize how detrimental they are to wetland systems. So I mean, increased turbidity, they're out there, you know, rooting in the mud. They, uh, they actually eat the exact same diet as a lame hen mallard, you know. So being this, how they're in the water, they're much more efficient at it than the mallard would be. So again, me being the duck guy, I want to see that mallard have a better chance at it. So if get carp out of there, the ducks do better. Um, you know, just with uh, the turbidity, um, you know, they increase the pH of the water, they just create a lot of problems. Um, you're not going to have a healthy wetland if you have carp in it. So again, just a, a quick schematic of uh, just what the impact of water quality is when you have carp. And that's the only difference in that lake, uh, the, those two uh, wetlands right there, just the carp in So, and then uh, again, to kind of drive home how the system works, this is Diamond Lake again. It did the drawdown, consolidate that soil, let the vegetation come up two years dry. That vegetation uh, basically kind of came in through all the shallow areas and then filled it back up. And um, this is ba basically three years after the lake was finished, you know, refilled. Uh, the 160 acre lake had 12,000 ducks on their spring migration, which is a pretty good population of birds out there. And it's because there's food there now. Before there wasn't food. You might go in there at the same time period a couple years before and you see 500 ducks. There just wasn't food there, birds didn't stay. And what really fascinates me is this is a three and a half year old perch that was introduced stock back in Diamond Lake. And so those initial stockings are up to 13 and a half inches now in just three and a half years. So, I mean, again, it's because there's food there. So, again, it doesn't matter if you're a duck guy, if you're fishing or what, paddling. Uh, that led to become a destination location for any kind of outdoor recreation in uh, that part of Dickinson County just because there's a lot to do there now just because the lake is cleaned up. And I'm just going to mention real briefly, you know, we talked a little bit about policy. Uh, you know, everything we do requires some kind of coordination with, uh, you know, government agencies and also the legislature here in the state because so many of these programs that, that we use on this, uh, they require funding um, annual appropriations and so we're always out there fighting for funding for lake restoration program or read for one of these other programs uh, and it changes drastically from year to year so you know to have a successful program and do these projects you have to continually be out there uh, basically fighting for the funding for that um, and so one thing right now that we're pushing for hard I don't know if, if uh, everybody remembers back in 2010, uh, Iowa voted for the Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund, a uh, constitutional amendment that uh, would put approximately $150 million into natural resources. Um, this is every, this, if it's approved, it has to be approved by the legislature now, and they have not done it, so we're kind of putting pressure on the legislature now to try to get that bill passed. Um, but that would could be, that would be a huge step forward in addressing all our habitat, water quality issues, um, you know, outdoor recreation issues here in the state. So again, if if, uh, if you're familiar with the Natural Resource and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund, talk to your legislator and you know put some pressure on it because I mean, it's any water-related issue in Iowa, this would have a huge benefit for it. So. All right, that's all I've got. Great. Good time for questions. Yes, we do have time for questions. I mean, first of all, like I say, if you have a big thing, so <coughs> Ducks Unlimited staff that we have here in the state. Um, Great to be able to bring them into the program. I'm excited, very excited to have had them here this year. So we have questions. We've got a uh, two two minutes, two and a half, three minutes. Pat? Um, is there any way in urban areas to attract ducks rather than geese? <laughs> <laughs> geese are one of those animals that have adapted very nicely uh, to the alterations we made. Um, mallards are those probably the ducks you're most familiar with. They are kind of the same way. They, they do very well in urban environments as long as they have a place, a secure place to nest. Um, what you're talking about there is probably a grass strip or something like that. A lot of times our lakes that attract geese in the city, those nice park lakes are mowed all the way down to the water. That makes it perfect for ducks. It doesn't necessarily make it good for geese. So again, putting that buffer strip back in there, you might see more ducks. You might see fewer geese. The geese want to be able to see. And if you put some kind of visual barrier around it, it'll be a little less confident. I was just curious, how do you get the carp out of messing and getting them, and then what do you do with them after you get them? Um, that's kind of, it, it all happens with the dewatering system. That's why, you know, the first thing we do is we dewater that lake. Uh, as much as we can. I mean, they're not necessarily flat bottom. Uh, 
Um, you know, being glaciated legs, a lot of them are kind of bowl shaped, and we have to put the structure out on the end. And so some of them we can pump down, there may be a couple feet left, we can get <coughs> free from the bottom, and it kills all the fish out there. And they're just there. I mean, there's just no marks for them. Um, I, I have worked, uh, I've worked for 10 years with you out in Oregon, and they're actually, you know, some of the refugees out there, they're harvesting the farm uh, and turn it into uh, organic fertilizer. You know, so I mean, the potential's there. But right now, they're just, you know, you just take the water away, let the park die, and put the structure in so they can't get back in. In uh, Boulder, Minnesota, southwest Minnesota, they have a smoked carp feed every year. So they're, it draws people from all over. Yeah. There's probably a lot of beer in Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> you said the smoke there, even though it's been sitting like that for decades? Yeah. In, in most cases, yeah. It, and it may not be as diverse, um, but the cattail and the heartstone bull rush won't always come back. Part of the cattail so you know, with the seeds blowing in the wind. Do you have a supplement that sometimes with seed or? You know, deer log have it. You know, deer log have it. I mean, they're, they're seeing pretty good results with that because there's just enough of around. Now, Fish and Wildlife Service and some of their um, more cow production areas, their shells, the smaller fossils, they're actually going and doing soil sampling to figure out where that historic layer is and how much sediment's coming up top of it. And they're actually excavating down to that. Pretty labor intensive, but the regeneration of, of the wetland vegetation is much more diverse and, and it's free. And, you know, we've done other projects where it's just been cornfields, we've got to go reintroduce it all, and it's 700 bucks an acre. You know, but they, they've been having good success with that, moving that soil out. How often should the water occur from these wetlands? And as a follow up, do you need agreements or contracts with the downstream land owners for the event? Okay, first, um, how often do you need water? Um, it kind of depends on the situation because, you know, the first one was done about 2009, so we really haven't been into it very long. Um, but we're anticipating maybe 10 years. It just depends on um, how quickly that system deteriorates because you're going to see muskrats come in and chew up that vegetation and open it up. Uh, you're going to see uh, additional water quality deteriorate. And so DNR right now is kind of developing criteria. It's like, okay, we can't. Visibility drop to this, let's dewater. And the good thing about that is once you do, you know, maybe all you gotta do is just dewater for over winter and, and then fill it back up. Maybe it's not a two year dewater like when you're doing the first process. So it might be quick after that. Um, and there are a lot of agreements, flood easements and things like that. Now we have to do everything within the ramifications of we can't impact anybody's drainage, we can't flood anybody. You know, so um, we have to live with the within the existing situation. So most of the time all the structures are sized to match bridge culverts, existing downstream culverts, things like that. So we're not going to have twice the capacity going out that the downstream culvert can handle. So, yeah, that wouldn't get too quick. <laughs> All right, well that, that takes us into the break. I know the poster session that we, that we're going to be going. Um, we'll have another session of floodplain management tomorrow. Um, Stormwater will be taking over after the break, so we'll see many of you in the same room. So I just want to again say thanks to Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we're out doing our watershed plans, our watershed actions. Mormon Watershed Group, let's not forget about these folks. They're out.